Hey again, Merry Christmas edition. So, this week we're doing an Ask Me Anything. There's actually a fair number of questions, so let's get right into it. Mordo Makar, which I probably mispronounced, had quite a few, so let's get theirs out of the way first. Uh, question number one from Mordo Makar is, your videos are more or less divided into general RPG slash fantasy design and say or says specific information. I like that since I'm mostly interested in the general musings on game design. But is there a specific reason, such as trying to incite conversation about your theories and opinions? Answer time. Lots of reasons. One of the big ones is I like to try to keep things organized, at least on my computer, other than my desktop. See, I can follow my own mess pretty easily, as I have a sprawling system that makes sense to me, but not much sense to anyone else. As such, when I'm dealing with other people, I try to keep things as clear and easy to follow as possible by breaking up the videos into specific themes and sections. Other people can find what they're looking for pretty easily. If someone's interested in, say, Orsa, it'd be nice if they can find that information. Same thing, if someone's interested in learning how to design a world, it should be simple to find the appropriate videos. Another reason is that it's spread out onto a rotation so that every other week is purely educational. And then the inverse is mostly stuff about my work. The Q&A sections, such as this one and Seorsa itself, are more open-ended, so I have more leeway with such. I also kind of like to play devil's advocate quite a lot. Uh, for the educational stuff, I mostly avoid it, but sometimes I'll slip something in there just to get people thinking about different ways to do stuff other than the traditional method. It's best to always examine new ideas and to decide if each is good or not on an individual level. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's good. The same is true in reverse, though. Tradition is a poor excuse for mediocrity. Anyway, next question. Uh, question number two. What do you think are good metrics or systems to classify RPGs by, and how would you play Sayorsa in their terms? Mmm, tricky, to be honest. There's multiple axes which could be used to plot out graphs, so this could be a mess. I think the most useful bits of information, though, are going to be axes of fun versus realism, uh, along with one of the power scale, one of how important the narrative and characters are, and one of the quality of combat mechanics. For Sayorsa, that would place it heavily into fun over realism. It's very much a game more than a simulation of reality, but it'll also be about three quarters of the way up the power skill graph, I'd say. You can get sillier, stronger games, but Sayorsa is fairly high end compared to something like D&D. It's not unreasonable for a hero to shadow of the Colossus, a giant monster, and bring it low, for instance, with big flashy moves. Additionally, a lot of games tend to be heavily to opposing extremes of both maintaining a character and narrative versus combat. Usually you get one or the other. Lots of story or good combat. Sayorsa is rare, sadly, in that it's built to have both catered to pretty heavily. Your character design and the world they exist within are important, but that shouldn't mean combat has to suffer. Uh, look at video games like Disgaea or Final Fantasy Tactics. Sure, there's some translation issues there, but 
these are games that had rather complex and interesting plots with enjoyable writing, yet their battle mechanics were amazing as well on top of that. I'm striving to make sure that Seorza reaches that kind of a level where players and GMs are able to build characters and worlds quickly and easily with a great deal of depth, and then have the tools to be epic with those characters within those settings. There's a lot of other metrics you could use, but the only other one I can think of that would really seem important to me is how well developed the base world is. Uh, is it like Shadowrun, where the world is heavily laid out already and you play the game because of the setting? Or is it more like D&D, where it has a rough outline but the bulk of the world building is handed over to the GM? Well, in that last metric, Seorce is kind of both and neither. The base game will provide GMs mostly with the tools to make their own world, as the world of Seorce itself is fairly vaguely defined. There's a few core concepts there as foundations, but most of it's built specifically for GMs to do what they want with it. The base is going to be offered free of charge. You can play an awesome game and get your friends all on the same page without having to shell out a ton of cash. The expansion stuff, however, is the exact opposite almost. Each book released after the first will be set on a different planet within the Seorsa universe, each with its own unique flora, fauna, cultures, history, and setting, along with new classes and species to play as, or to expand the species that already exist with subspecies. Some planets will be high-tech, others medieval in nature, or even sort of renaissance style. These will be provided for a cost, though fairly cheap. I'm looking at only like five to ten a piece, probably. These are meant to cater to different genres of play, or to just expand the universe, with some really neat ideas I wanted to include in the core game, but couldn't realistically add. Like, to be blunt, I've got, what, I think it's like ten pages dedicated to each species. I'd put a hundred, but, you know, that would take forever. <laughs> I'd like to go over their homeworlds and stuff, but that's gonna have to be relegated to uh, expansion content, so yeah. Anyway, next question. Uh, question number three. What is your definition slash understanding of an opinion of the so-called rule of cool? To be clear to those who may not recognize this concept, the rule of cool generally states that if something is awesome enough, you're allowed to do it, even if it's maybe not that realistic or fitting. Whether this is a good idea or not depends heavily upon the nature of the game in question. In a game like Legend of the Five Rings, the concept of the rule of cool would be a terrible bad idea since it more or less ruined the whole game. In something like Anima Beyond Fantasy, they literally have a style skill which does absolutely nothing in terms of the gameplay, but can be rolled to be fancy and show off, and has exploding dice on a d100 roll. I have seen people nail 600 plus on a style roll before. And it's amazing. So we're set a bit in the middle of those two extremes. I want players to be able to do some over-the-top stuff, but I also want it to be balanced. As such, the mechanics are being built in such a way that you can generally invoke the rule of cool, so long as it's within one order of magnitude of the power skill that's being used in the game itself and the rules can actually handle it in a fair manner. Meaning, if you want to swing from the chandelier across the room and kick an enemy out the window and over the cliff, yeah, sure, you can do that. It's not even difficult for a GM to come up with the effectiveness of what that kind of an attack would do. 
Yeah, if you wanted to pick a kobold up by the ankles and use it as a baseball bat to smack another one through a wall, no problem. It's not in the rules directly, but the rules can handle that kind of stuff with ease. Not every game should be built to be able to handle that kind of stuff, and the more serious and closer to a simulation of reality you get, the less applicable the rule of cool becomes. Seorza, however, is more than willing to indulge players in some crazy stuff, and encourages GMs to let them go a little wild with it, but to also let the enemies do some off the wall stuff as well sometimes. Consider that you're warning the first time you try to protest an ogre using a goblin as a battering ram to break down a door with its skull. Uh, question number four. Uh, especially with the popularization of HEMA, or Historical European Martial Arts, uh, what's your opinion on higher demands for verisimilitude? in terms of rules for martial engagements and equipment. Also, in their interactions with typical fantasy concepts, such as a weapon of sword size not being particularly useful against a house-sized dragon, no matter the wielder's strength. Alright, I like for combat to have some realism to it in the sense that I swing my sword, it's kind of boring. Having to wind up a big attack or actually making use of weapons for what they were designed to do is something I've been working on. Whether they're realistic, however, is their matter entirely. I'm going for what's entertaining more than what would really work. Meaning, yeah, you can climb the back of a dragon and stab it in the head and it will hurt, but the tricky part is getting the dragon to let you climb on its back and stab it in the head in the first place. The accuracy of weapons themselves is centered more around what they did for realsies to a degree. Like, a maul is a big, heavy and slow moving weapon. It's not meant for rapid blows. It's meant to knock someone on their butt on the first swing. It bashes through heavy plate, making it much more effective as such, instead of a sword that would bounce off harmlessly. More complex weapons and martial arts styles take these into account and allow for more interest in combat styles. That's just how I'm doing it for Sayorsa though. In terms of how it matters overall, mostly I'm a stickler for weapons feeling different and having distinctively different purposes and play styles. I'm not so picky about them being super realistic in other games, unless the game itself is centered around realism. I'm mostly just insistent that a sword and an axe don't just wind up both dealing a generic 1d8 damage with no real mechanical difference to them at all because that really annoys me. Treating a buckler and a tower shield differently as they were meant for rather different purposes is icing on the cake. Fortunately, I love icing. So, we're on to question number five. How do you play test Sayorsa? And what are your experiences with it so far? Now, Sayorsa is still in a pre-alpha state, in that it's not quite a hundred percent possible to build a character from scratch in the system and do much with the character yet. Some of the mechanics are still being reworked, and some concepts are still being tested for basic validity and player appeal. What this means is that a lot of the playtesting at this stage of the game isn't truly playtesting. Some of it is, but it more often means showing off ideas to my task groups and getting their thoughts back on such. The majority of the actual playtesting is done by myself personally by running through test numbers on characters I've built by the rules, uh, which exist so far, and testing to see how they work in a theoretical situation, such as a group of four players surrounded by 15 kobold-esque monsters at level 1. 
they actually stand a chance, or are they doomed to failure from the start kind of thing? As an additional form of playtesting, even though the game's not really ready for use as a playable system yet, the species concepts have been being put through their paces just to see how they feel as a personality and culture, with some of their core mechanics being put to use by converting them into other games for the time being. I build a character using my rules, then convert them over to a different system, or even freeform RP uh, them out for a bit to see how they actually work in practice as a concept. Do they feel fun to play? Is the overall purpose behind the species actually enjoyable? Do they properly give off the kind of vibe I expect them to? And do they integrate as expected with other players? As more of the rules are more fully fleshed out, I test them against the combination of people who have played other tabletop RPGs and some who have no real notable experience to speak of, to gauge reactions from both people who have set expectations and those who don't even know what an attack role is. I've done playtesting for video games before, both as a tester and overseeing the testers playing my game. So, some of the concepts from there are carried over as well. Things like, here's the rule for dragons, see if you can come up with three completely different dragon characters you'd like to play as, while still being distinctively dragon-ish. A good chunk of that internal playtesting by myself at the moment, as they're not fully 100% ready for being put to use in that manner yet. And if I could reference something but it's missing, I can write it up on the spot because I generally already know how most of the game works at this point. It's mostly just the act of actually writing it out because there's so much that still is only in note form, not fully fleshed out written mechanics format yet. Uh, question number six. What's your opinion on player base building? Do you prefer to represent the development mechanically or purely narratively? I love base building. It's built right into Seorsa as a narrative element and as a mechanical benefit for players. It helps get players involved in the location, the NPCs in the area, the struggles they face, and the factions that are present. It also helps to have a base of operations to spend all that money they got on for upgrading things like their private library, or their personal forge, or defensive structures in case someone decided their castle or ship or whatever would make for a great target to attack with an actual army. Not every game is well suited to such, but it's a core component of Zeorsa's gameplay, and I personally love having a home base to operate out of and to build up over time. It would be nice if it showed up in more games, honestly. Question number seven! Finally, since you mentioned it, what games have you worked on and what are you especially proud of? Oh, there's a few I'm really pleased with. I'm gonna cut this down to just one or I'll be here all day. I think my absolute favorite game I worked on was Silesia, which had previously been called How to Throw Snow, with the O in two being the big snowball. But the name had to be changed a week before announcing it once Blizzard announced their game Heroes of the Storm was going to be called Hots as well, and We'd never, ever show up on any search engine result with the same acronym in use. Celestia was the first game where I had near absolute creative control of almost everything. I had divs on the world design, most of the game mechanics, artwork, writing, the tutorial, even the music I had final say on, and got to talk with the musician directly to build up progressive works where the music gradually became more epic with additional instruments and sections added based on the player's progress in a given story chapter. The basic idea 
was a simple snowball fight on iOS for phones and tablets and such. Simple enough concept. It evolved into an epic story about a new kid at school ending up battling the seven deadly snow ninjas. Side plots involving a mafia controlled alien spaceship mutilating cows into lawn nodes. A bizarre night Templar-esque faction who worship the flying spaghetti monster, selling meatballs door to door, uh, pirate ships, giant robot fights, and so on. It got a little silly, to say the least, but yeah, that was kind of the idea. In short, it was a bunch of kids with overactive imaginations coming up with a ridiculous communal story behind their snowball fight over the course of the winter at school. It also covered a lot of more serious things as well, from child abuse and negligence to trying to live up to unrealistic standards set by others and bullying, each done in a realistic manner in terms of how to actually deal with such, but covered in a more fantastic, silly veil so it didn't get too serious for younger kids to play. The gameplay involved swiping across the screen to dodge out of the way of snowballs, to toss them with both strength and aim, and various hazards like uh, ice or piles of heavy snow to wade through. For things like bells that could be hit to ring out loudly and cause snow piled on rooftops to collapse, and a few mini games gradually introduced over time, including a cooperative campaign and boss fights. So, yeah, Silesia was my favorite. I've also worked on Giddy Cook and Side Quest, along with a few other minor titles in lesser ways. I also worked as lead editor for the now defunct Game News website 20 Ounds and I've done a fair bit of ghostwriting, both for novels and the occasional RPG. Unfortunately, I can't say much about those due to rather strict non-disclosure agreements. Anyway, that's it from Mortal Macar. Uh, lots of questions! Ooh. Next up, we have Silence Coder with a few more. Uh, question number 8. Task resolution or conflict resolution and why? Generally, I aim for task resolution. Tasks have a specific start and end, and you can tell when they've been fully resolved pretty clearly. Conflicts go on for quite some time, and as conflicts tend to provide a source of character growth, it's not actually always in your best interest to, you know, resolve the conflict. Sometimes it's better to let a grudge last for a long time, though I tried to avoid such in reality. Question number 9. Two equally matched warriors fight each other, using a longsword and a flail respectively. So how does this fight play out, and in whose favor? Mm, depends on a lot of factors, actually. What kind of armor are they wearing for one sense? Longswords deal normal damage, and flails are crushing damage. See, normal's great against unarmored targets, but has problems punching through heavily armored enemies. Crushing damage has a higher base damage, but instead of skilling for damage with more strength, it ignores armor, making it ideal for knocking those heavily armored targets senseless. Flails also are a lot better at knockback, and can be used to shove enemies into walls for bonus damage, so the terrain would be a factor as well. Toss in that both weapon types have their own unique attack types they can use, with swords having a wider mixture of status effects compared to most other weapon types, and flails focusing more on stuns and knockbacks, it may be a bit less obvious who the winner is. Generally speaking though, if we're considering unarmored targets, I generally say the sword would probably win out, simply because it scales for damage better and is a bit faster on the swings it makes, so would outpace the flail. 
if those combatants were in heavy armor, then the flail would probably be the winner, especially if there was some good solid terrain to slam the longsword wielder into. The specifics of how it would play out would likely involve the longsword user trying to stack up some bleed effects, and then keeping the flail user off balance while the flail user attempts to ragdoll the longsword user into a wall, or a tray, or pretty much anything else in range. Flails are kind of built to be more of a tanky or support weapon in Sayorza than an upfront damage weapon, so yeah. Probably wind up going to the longsword in most cases, I think. Uh, question number 10. Which common thing people tend to miss during a world building? I think the biggest one is not knowing how stuff works. Even if the readers or players don't need to know, the world designer should know why stuff works and how it works, because it avoids plot holes, allows for lots of narrative building, and you can foreshadow stuff and reference it if you know it exists and how it works. Magic is an especially bad offender for this, where people just tend to shrug and go, oh, it's magic. If you don't know how it works, you're just walking into a nightmare of problems for yourself later on down the road. And sort of tangential, but related, is how magic affects the flora and fauna of the world. If you have high background mana levels, it's going to affect the other living creatures present. Some games do this well, such as Shadowrun and World of Darkness, but a lot of writers of generic fantasy have a very bad habit of not actually using magic in any sort of meaningful manner most of the time. Uh, question 11. Which aspect of CRPGs hasn't been changed for ages while it clearly should be? I had to check for clarification on this. One, and it means things like Planescape Torment or Gothic. So, I think honestly the biggest thing computer games have stuck to but shouldn't have is clinging mindlessly to rules that only work with the GM present. Like, Shadowrun Returns is a great game, but it's clinging too heavily to the rules for actual Shadowrun, and it doesn't work that well. Planescape Torment is one of the best games ever made, but it really showed how blindly following D&D's rules made it sort of suck. Neverwinter Nights, same deal as it is with the same with so many others. If you're going to make a computer game, then put the fact that you have a computer instead of a GM to work for you. Don't just carbon copy over rules that don't really work properly without a GM there to fudge the dice or tweak things. More than that though, a computer game can be amazingly complex under the hood. It doesn't have to worry about players being able to figure out stuff in their heads. The players just need a final estimation of their changes with like a percentage chance and that's about it. They don't need to know the specific details, but those details should be available for players who love that kind of stuff. Like, uh, me. Yes, I will read a 500 page document of mechanics formula because I guess I'm weird like that. So are probably a lot of other game designers, but the average player doesn't care. Anyway, the point is CRPGs that try to pretend they're TTRPGs, or computer games that try to pretend they're tabletop role-playing games, pretending they have a GM when they don't, and not making use of the C in the CRPG part, is just ridiculous and has been going on for like 20 plus years at this point. That crap has to change. Use the tools you have for what they were meant to do. Make use of them. Anyway. Uh, next question. Uh, question number 12. What's your favorite plot? Ooh, this is open-ended. I'm gonna take it as such and say my favorite plot is Oh, it'd be unfair to say one of mine I've written. 
<laughs> all right, all right. I'm gonna go with a novel, actually. Ghost War. One of the Mech Warrior Dark Age series, actually the first one, written by Michael A. Stackpole, is probably one of the best plots I've ever seen, and was used to tie in Mech Warrior 4 Mercenaries to the newer miniatures game Mech Warrior Dark Age. There's plot twists all over the place, the overarching concept is eloquent in its simplicity on a broad scale, and its nuanced complexities on a smaller scale are amazing. It flows beautifully from one situation to the next, each one making logical sense, but also tying the story together. If this question is meant more of as an overarching plot, I think the same book's concept still applies though. A disaster of some sort messes with communication lies, and we get to see how awful people can be when there's no one watching over their shoulder any longer. When the government disappears, the police vanish, when the zombies roam the streets, or the plague wipes out nine-tenths of the world's population, or everyone goes blind, humans are both horrible to each other and can rise to the most noble of deeds. Seeing an exploration of what people do when they no longer are truly enforced by society's standards any longer is probably my favorite plot of all, regardless of the details, because it shows humanity and really lets you get into the characters' heads. Now, even good people can excuse some horrible actions when they think they're necessary for survival. Anyway, that's it from Silence Coder, so thanks for those questions. Uh, the next question is from... Oh, hey, my boyfriend. How did I get in there? Hmm, I think we know. That's okay, it's a good question. Question number 13. Lucky 13. What has been the most rewarding about interacting with people while developing your game? Well... Honestly, the excitement some of them have shown. As with any project, there's going to be some people who display apathy and some who feel like they just want to ruin everything, and not in a constructive way either. On the other hand, there have been some people who have been like, that is so freaking cool, I want to try that. And you can just feel that rush of excitement from them, that even just mentioning what you've been working on is enough to make them happy, to make their day a little bit better than it would have been otherwise. It's a great feeling to know that something you designed elicits the reaction you were looking for, but I think it's really just knowing that, well... I set out to make this less for fame and fortune, and more for creating something that would get people interested in a hobby I personally enjoy. Some of the most vocal supporters of my game, who have been the most excited when I show them stuff I've been working on, have been people who have never even touched a tabletop role-playing game before I started working on Seorsa and now several of them have picked up various games in the meantime. Even if I somehow fail miserably and no one wants to play my game, I still accomplish something that there are now more people role-playing in the world than there were when I started, and it's a direct cause of what I've done. I've introduced them to a new way to have fun and to see them light up when they hear about what I'm doing to push the industry forward from my small little end of it? Well, it helps to keep me going in this moment of doubt. Luca has question number 14. What are some of the difficulties and roadblocks you've come across while developing Sayorsa? Can you name some of them and how you've overcome them? I personally admire how you've been taking all of this pretty much on your own, so I wanted to know. Alright, thanks, Luca. <laughs> That's great and all. Alright, um, 
mechanics wise, trying to come up with a magic system that was both versatile and functional. Being quick and easy to use was a real challenge. I think I went through five major overhauls of the system or something like that. I practically rebuilt the entire mana system nearly from scratch three times before I was happy with it at all. In the end though, simplifying the mana to use action points like everything else rather than a separate resource that converted back and forth streamlined a ton. And introducing elements like spell complexity and spell potency allowed for a lot more control both for players and how their spells work and for my side of things with keeping spells balanced and fair to use. Uh, another rough one I've been tackling is an issue with how defensive actions will work. I keep rebuilding it, but it never quite comes out right. The tricky bit is, it needs to cost action points to be used, so that there's a choice to be made between pure offense and defense, or striking a balance in between. The most obvious solutions all backfire, by turning the game into a turtling game without much reason to attack. So it's been kind of nasty getting around it. When I actually have an answer, I'll let you know how I overcame it, because I'm still toying with a variety of potential fixes at the moment. I'd like for there to be a single elegant solution, but it may end up having to be piecemealed together from several smaller concepts. Or a total rework of the whole thing from scratch. Again. Uh, for a non-mechanics issue, artwork has been plaguing me for like a bloody year now. And the cash kept disappearing for stuff I absolutely needed and I couldn't scrounge together enough. That got fixed with, uh, well, a will from my grandmother's dad, so... I had the first major bit of artwork paid off, but then there was the election thing that put the artist into a panic after buying into the if Trump wins doomsday fearmongering and it put it on hold for a bit. I'd like to say that I did something to solve this, but really my patrons from Patreon and my grandmother were the ones to fix this for me. I simply don't have the time to divide on making money somewhere else and building the game as well. If I stop now, I'd probably never finish. So yeah. Still, it's dealt with now, and soon there'll be some really awesome art from an amazing fantasy artist. Soon being unknown. I'm hoping within the next month or three for things to calm down once that's out of the way I'll have a baseline of reference for the character sheet and can start hiring out other artwork. Or put it in another way. Once I get the first round done, I can get lots more way easier. Fortunately, it's paid for already, so it's all good. Uh, just annoying delays is all, but it'll be worth it. For a personal issue, well, I've had to struggle with depression on and off for years, and it can take a frustrating chunk of time wasted dealing with that crap, which I'd much rather spend on work. The last month or so, I've developed a ridiculous inferiority complex of the most frustrating kind. It doesn't have any clear evidence for such, but uh, I've been feeling useless and incapable of doing absolutely anything right at all several times a day lately. It's done, because mentally I'm aware there's no basis in fact for the feelings of absolute inadequacy. But stupid emotions, don't care, and instead I blow through 3-4 hours crying in bed instead of being productive. Yay, stupid brain! <sighs> Somebody order me a new one, this one's defective. Anyway, it's a dumb situation and I'm glad to just be rid of, but <sighs> it's definitely been a difficulty while developing Zyorsa for a while now. Fortunately, it can't halt production entirely, and I'm able to work long enough hours to mostly make up for it. But it has slowed things down a bit compared to the rate I'd like to be going at. Then again, the rate I'd like to be going at is 24-7, without sleep or food, entertainment, or anything else. So yeah, that may be a slightly unrealistic desire. 
so dropping down to only something like 30 to 40 hours a week still really isn't that bad. I mean, it's not less than the 60 to 70 I normally can maintain, but it's still not horrible. Ah, uh, for question number 15, Tuna Puna Press asks, why do you think the development of your TTRPG has taken so long? Short answer, because I don't tend to take on realistic scaled projects. I tend to bite off way more than any one person should have to chew. I succeed, eventually, but it takes a while. <laughs> like, for a project of this scale, I should have a team of about 12 to 20 people or so. I have one. So yeah, it's going a lot slower than I'd hoped. I also severely underestimated the speed at which certain tasks could be accomplished due to previous experience in video game design. Some things that used to take a day or two sometimes take weeks here. Building new mechanics from scratch that replace b b broken concepts that have been around for 40 plus years is not remotely as quick as I had expected. Normally with game design, I can just pump out solutions pretty easily, but this time around, I've run into some really big ones which have been showing me full well why the industry hasn't solved some of these problems adequately, despite having decades to do so. I mean, yeah, I could just grab some previous fixes that were sort of halfway there, but I'm not happy with sort of good enough. I'm a bit too much of a perfectionist, and I'm not going to be happy until some of these things are dealt with properly. The all ensuring different weapon types behave differently took ages to get done right without bogging down the game with clunky combat mechanics, for instance. Same with a versatile spell system! What I've got now is bloody beautiful. It's elegant, it's effective, and well, I don't know. I'm hoping it marks a new standard for decades to come. Actually, I'm hoping it kicks things forwards, and someone else takes my ideas and makes them even better within a few months. If someone can make everything I did better than me in a year, I'd be ecstatic. Maybe less so for my paycheck, but to see the entire industry leap forwards like that would be amazing. Anyway, basically I took on way too large of a project as usual. It's chronically underfunded and understaffed, and complexity problems I've had to solve are orders of magnitude more difficult than they first appeared. So it's slower than I doubt. But all things considered, it's actually clipping along uh, surprisingly quickly at this rate. Tuna Puna Press also has number 16. Are there habits you developed as a video game designer or ghostwriter that are also applicable to TTRPG design? Oh yeah, definitely. Some of them are workflow related, like learning when to let a problem lie while I work on something else, and come back to it later on after I've had some time to settle on it and look at it from a new perspective. Other habits are simply things just like time management. I learned a while ago that I'm at my best for problem solving and creative design when I'm half asleep. So I wake up a few times a night, scribble down notes, wake up in the morning, and try to make sense of the incoherent rambling. I can make sense while awake, but the capacity to leap between solutions in rapid fire order is something I do vastly better when tired and my brain's not restricted by language or the order of patterned thinking any longer, so I make use of that dichotomy as much as I can. Back when I was doing my early world design stuff, I picked up the habit of starting everything from core fundamental bedrock levels. Start with the foundation, and the next layer tends to build itself from your previous work. Uh, from ghostwriting, I found many, many traps are great because you can keep building on ideas you came up with on the previous pass and integrate new ideas into the next one. A uh, mechanics issue with video game design I picked up on was when I was only just starting to learn about it was the half or double, doubling or halving everything numeric if it's too big or too small. 
it saves a ton of time in the long run. You'd be surprised how often you think doubling something is going to be way too much, and then it turns out you need to make it like eight times bigger instead because two times wasn't enough. Doubling it at a time or halving cuts the total work time spent on balancing the numbers by a ton. From just working in various areas, I've learned how to manage that stupid depression stuff mentioned earlier, so that it sucks up way less time than it used to as well. It's still not great. I'd just as soon be rid of it entirely, but since that's probably not gonna happen until well after the game's released, mitigating the damage substantially works well enough for the most part. Whew, marathon over. 16 questions are more than I thought there'd be, but hey, it's done. If a little late. Anyway. I hope you found the information useful, and have a merry, felicited season of unvarnished greed and avarice. Or Merry Christmas, whatever. And with that, I'm out. I'll see you next time!